Hello and welcome to Health Professional Radio. I'm your host, Neil Howard. Glad that you could come back for another segment. In this segment, we're going to be having a conversation with Dr. Michael Irizarry. He's joining us here from Azi Incorporated to talk about the latest data presented at ADPD 2022 from the Phase 2 study on lecanemab in the treatment of early Alzheimer's disease. Welcome to Health Professional Radio. Dr. Irizarry, thank you for taking the time. Thank you, Neil. It's a pleasure to be here. Tell us a bit about yourself and uh, talk about your role at AZA, if you would. Uh, certainly. Uh, so I'm a neurologist by training. I lead uh, clinical development at, uh, for neurosciences at AZA, so I'm responsible for the clinical trials phase one through phase uh, four uh, for neurodegeneration, sleep, and epilepsy. Uh, prior to that, I uh, worked in the neurosciences and epidemiology areas at, at Eli Lilly and GlaxoSmithKline uh, and uh, had uh, trained and seen patients uh, in the memory disorders unit at Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston. Alzheimer's is not a, a coverall for all types of dementia. Is that correct? That's right. Alzheimer's is a specific cause of dementia. Uh, so uh, dementia is the syndrome of, of progressive cognitive decline, uh, generally starting with uh, memory impairment. Uh, and that can be caused by, by several different neurodegenerative diseases or similar types of symptoms can, can be caused uh, by uh, by vitamin B12 deficiency or, or other types of causes. But Alzheimer's disease specifically is defined by the presence of its characteristic neuropathology, uh, amyloid plaques, uh, and neurofibrillary tangles. Uh, amyloid plaques are uh, accumulations of a protein called amyloid beta protein extracellularly uh, in the cortex of the brain. And that can begin up to 20 years prior to the onset of symptoms. Uh, neurofibrillary tangles are accumulation of a protein uh, called tau inside of nerve cells. Uh, and those, uh, that tends to begin uh, with the onset of symptoms and spread throughout the brain with the, the progression of, of dementia. In addition to those characteristic features, there's also neurodegeneration, so loss of nerve cells uh, and loss of the, the synapses uh, between nerve cells uh, that are uh, that contribute to to the symptoms as well. Now, although there is no cure for Alzheimer's, uh, you mentioned some of the signs coming 20 years before the actual onset of serious symptoms. How often is Alzheimer's detected early, and is it significant to treat it early? Will that slow the progression or stall the progression? So now there are biomarkers, so imaging or blood tests, that can detect the neuropathological changes of, of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, so amyloid PET, for instance, can uh, provide a, uh, an image and a quantitation of the amyloid plaques in the brain. Uh, and studies in, uh, in cognitively normal individuals above the age of 65 suggests that, it, that as many as, as 30% can have uh, elevated levels of, of amyloid in the brain uh, and yet be asymptomatic. Mm. Uh, so there has been a, a push to test treatments for Alzheimer's disease earlier in the disease course before there's been significant irreversible neurodegeneration. Uh, and as an example, uh, we are testing our uh, anti-amyloid protofibril drug, uh, lecanemab, a, a drug that uh, lowers amyloid plaques. We're testing that in this uh, preclinical AD population, meaning individuals that uh, are cognitively normal but have evidence of elevated amyloid in the brain by amyloid PET. Uh, so we do believe that the, the earlier that we can treat the potential to prevent or delay the onset of symptoms, and we're testing that in, in this clinical trial called AHEAD-345. 
This data for this clinical trial was presented at Alzheimer's and Parkinson's Disease Conference 2022, the, the phase two study of, as you said, lecanemab in the treatment of early Alzheimer's. What were some of the significant findings and are there any updates on lecanemab prior to this phase two study? The uh, design of the AHEAD 345 study, the preclinical study, was presented at ADPD. Um, and many of the, the features that we used to design that study came out of the phase two study of lecanemab, as you mentioned. Uh, the phase two study was a large dose ranging study of lecanemab in the early AD population. Uh, so these are individuals already with uh, clinical symptoms, uh, either mild cognitive impairment uh, or mild AD dementia with confirmed elevated amyloid in the brain. Uh, the study design was a very unique uh, study design of uh, a Bayesian adaptive randomization. So five dose groups uh, uh, versus placebo uh, were, re were treated for 18 months, and the randomization was adapted uh, by uh, through interim analyses during the course of the study that, that were blinded to the team. But uh, the randomization was weighted toward the doses that were most likely to show efficacy. Uh, that study uh, identified the 10 milligram per kilogram IV biweekly dose uh, as the dose most likely to show uh, efficacy on a, a, a novel composite outcome, clinical outcome measure called ADCOMS, which is particularly sensitive to change in early AD. Uh, the overall results of that study showed a dose and time dependent reduction of amyloid plaque in the brain, and the extent of reduction of amyloid in the brain was correlated to the amount of slowing in progression that was identified in that study. Those, those were the key results of the double-blind phase. Once those results were available, we initiated an open-label extension phase where everybody uh, was treated with a 10 milligrams per kilogram IV biweekly, uh, and that that Open label extension phase was started on the average of about two years after people completed the double blind phase. So, this provided us a unique opportunity uh, to identify what happens when these treatments uh, are stopped and then when they are reinitiated. Is there an also a, a new subcutaneous formulation of lecanemab as well? Yes. Uh, so, we presented the plan for our subcutaneous development uh, for lecanemab. We have a subcutaneous IV formulation that, that's already been developed and tested in phase one. Uh, and we, through the modeling of the data in the phase two study, uh, we've designed the sub-Q dose to have the same average concentration uh, which is most closely linked to the amount of amyloid clearance. So we, we are matching the, the average concentration of sub-Q with that of IV that resulted in the, the greatest amyloid clearance. Uh, we know from that modeling also that the main adverse event that's uh, seen with these amyloid-lowering drugs uh, are amyloid-related imaging abnormalities, and in particular, area E, uh, which is a, a form of swelling in the brain uh, that can be symptomatic and that, that occurs early in treatment and then uh, tends to resolve. Uh, the rate of area E appears to be related to the peak concentration or the Cmax of lecanemab. And because the sub-Q dosing form has a, a lower Cmax or blunted Cmax because of the, the slower absorption through the subcutaneous space, we believe that the, the same dose that has the equivalent efficacy of the IV form will have a, a lower rate of these uh, area E uh, abnormalities, so, so an even better safety profile that, than our IV form. We also presented at ADPD information on the safety profile of lecanemab, in particular area E that I mentioned before. Uh, area 
E is a adverse event that's associated with amyloid lowering therapies, and it's important for clinicians to understand how to manage and monitor area E. In our phase two study in the open label extension, we saw overall rates of area E under 10% and rates of symptomatic area E of under 2%. Uh, with increased risks in individuals uh, that carry the APO lipoprotein E, E4 isoform. Uh, and uh, these rates will be uh, further evaluated in our ongoing phase three study clarity, called Clarity AD. Give us a website or a resource where we can learn more about the study and about the developments uh, happening at ASI Incorporated. Uh, people can go to the ASI website, us.asi.com, to learn about the ASI pipeline as well as the new data presented at ADPD. And ASI is E-I-S-A-I dot com, correct? Correct. I do appreciate you giving us a bit of your time this morning, Doctor. It's uh, been a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you. You've been listening to Health Professional Radio. I'm your host, Neil Howard, in conversation with Dr. Michael Irizarry. Audio copies of this program are available at hpr.fm and healthprofessionalradio.com.au. You can also subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, listen in, download at SoundCloud, and be sure and subscribe to our YouTube channel at youtube.com, Health Professional Radio.